We are at the EuroPCR 2023 and I'm Nina van der Hoeven from the VU University Medical Center and I have the pleasure to be here with uh, Professor Colin from uh, Glasgow. Welcome. Thank you. So um, I'm looking forward to yeah. discuss a few things about Minoka today with you. Um, let's start with the diagnostic approach. Yes. Could you tell us something about the general diagnostic approach in your center? It's focused on the cath lab. Um, the angiogram is essential in order to make the diagnosis. So prior to the cath lab, the patient journey may involve blood troponin, ECG, echocardiogram, but it's really in the cath lab where the angiogram's done, the invasive angiogram, um, and usually it's a surprise finding. Uh, with an ACS, we're expecting a blocked coronary artery and there's, there may be atherosclerosis, but there's no obstructive disease. And it's important the clinician recognizes, okay, this is Minoka, and then you take it from there. Okay, <clears throat> and what are the next steps that you take from there? So you've got to pursue a cause. Try and understand why has this patient had an ACS? Okay, what are the relevant elements of the history um, that could be spontaneous chest pain in association with stress, for example? Um, then look to the ECG. Is it ST elevation? Does it localize to the precordial leads? Has an echocardiogram been done? Is there a wall motion abnormality? And, and does the wall motion abnormality tie in with the ECG? findings because sometimes it doesn't yeah so that's also all these things are also to exclude other causes than minoka yes. right <clears throat> such yeah. as myocarditis dacotubo exactly yeah, yeah. okay so yeah. when and when we exclude these causes yeah. uh, how do we approach uh, these minoka patients in the cat lab so key question is is there atherosclerosis we know from cohort studies that Patients who have Minoka, but with atherosclerosis, their prognosis is, is less good. So if there's atherosclerosis, um, is it plaque rupture, plaque corrosion? Do I need to better understand the pathology that raises the question of intravascular ultrasound, intravascular OCT? Or are the coronaries completely smooth? Actually, is there no angiographic evidence of disease at all? but the patient's had an ACS, this is a real conundrum. So you might start to think about coronary spasm or microvascular dysfunction. So you've got to think about the patient, the, the key findings, and then tailor your next steps uh, accordingly. Yeah, so if we start with microvascular uh, spasm uh, and epicardial spasm, what kind of tests do you use in your own hospital to uh, investigate these patients? So if I'm thinking of a coronary functional disorder or a coronary vasomotor disorder, um, what does that mean? Well, you could look to the guidelines, look to some of the expert groups like Covadis. There's a lot of information out there, but uh, microvascular dysfunction, impaired vasodilator reserve, resistance, a lot of that information can be gathered from a guide wire. It's very straightforward, a diagnostic guide wire that's used uh, normally to measure FFR, you can, you can capture these parameters. So that is really straightforward. Check that the patient's going to tolerate adenosine, that there isn't heart yeah. block. Think and about the safety. And then um, you're aiming, I think, at C CFR and IMR. CFR and IMR. Yeah. And think about the artery. And the, I mentioned about regional changes on yeah. the ECG. So anterior, pass the guide wire to the LED. Inferior, consider circumflex if it's dominant or the right coronary artery. Yeah. Um, oftentimes that can give a lot of information. It can diagnose microvascular dysfunction or it can exclude it based on the criteria. So an IMR higher than 25, a CFR less than 2 or maybe less than 2.5. Yeah. Um, if you want to take this paradigm one step further, it's all normal. You've got an ACS, you've got smooth coronary arteries, but these metrics are normal. So a next step possibly could be acetylcholine testing. Doesn't need to be done straight away. Yeah, it if can it, be in a planned procedure. Could be a planned procedure. Yeah. yeah. 
And there, are, I think there are a lot of uh, people that still uh, have issues regarding the safety of ACE2 choline. Yes. How do you feel about these issues? So on the one hand, rightly so. I think like any, any procedure in interventional cardiology, there needs to be education and training and build up experience. Um, and with these considerations um, secured, if you will, then acetylcholine is actually guideline indicated, at least 2B, potentially 2A. Um, and it can be done acutely, experienced operator, considerations about that, but also the patient, if they wish a clear diagnosis, the patient may absolutely be interested in coming back for an elective procedure for elective acetylcholine testing. So we can say that in experienced hands, ACE2 choline testing is actually safe. There has been a lot of studies regarding the safety. Uh, and if we, do the, uh, if we take the right steps and uh, it's in experienced hands, it's safe to perform. That's correct. And do you feel like we should perform it more often than we do now in clinical practice? Yes. Yeah. I do. Okay. Okay. Because is spasm a big, a major contributor to Minoka? So that's a, that's a straightforward question, yeah. but it's a tough answer because systematic acetylcholine testing has only been done in some limited studies. Um, but probably yes is the answer. How prevalent? Um, microvascular dysfunction is probably more common than coronary spasm. Mm -hmm. So probably there's going to be a positive response in maybe one in three patients on microvascular. Coronary spasm, maybe 10 to 15 uh, percent of patients. But, but again, it's patient selection. So I gave the example of smooth coronary arteries, ACS. Mm -hmm. It's more likely in that type of patient than a patient with atherosclerosis who's had plaque rupture you've got a, a diagnosis there. So in that type of patient, acetylcholine testing is probably not necessary, not yeah. indicated. Yeah. So if, if we can round the CAT lab, um, I think we have the microvascular testing, the yep. spasm testing or the vasomotor yep. uh, testing, and uh, maybe also an LV angio. So my favorite measurement is the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> it's so easy to yeah, measure. Yeah. And it's prognostically so important. Yeah. So a normal is 12 millimeters of mercury, maybe 10 or less. But if it's above 18, that points to diastolic dysfunction, but it's also got a prognostic implication. It's taking your patient into the domain of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Yeah. And you, we don't want a patient to pass through a cath lab with that diagnosis potentially missed. Yeah, so it's an easy parameter and you use it a lot. Yes. Yeah, okay. So if we go past the CAT lab, yeah. um, what's the role of CMR? So, so CMR is going to further help, further help to clarify the diagnosis. Um, CMR will tell us if there is late gadolinium enhancement, if contrast is given, which represents scar. And if there's scar or fibrosis, the pattern will tell us whether this is subendocardial myocardial infarction or is there interstitial fibrosis that might be a more unusual presentation such as cardiac amyloid, which is in itself associated with small vessel disease, supply demand mismatch type 2 MI, Minoka, um, yeah. So late enhancement imaging is very helpful there, but then also the non-contrast aspects in the MRI examination, such as T1 mapping and T2 mapping. T1 can tell us about inflammation, local inflammation. Actually, this is a case of myocarditis. Uh, T2 mapping will tell us about myocardial edema. Yeah. But you have all of this information in one examination plus, of course, LV dimensions, LV function. So CMR is guideline indicated 1B at least. It really is something that if available, um, we should be considering for our, we should be recommending for our patients. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And um, 
what do you think of the timing of the CMR? Um, yeah. Because we discussed this today. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, yeah. So within 14 days, if possible, um, there are studies to, to show the diagnostic findings fall with time from the initial event because of resolution of edema. Um, there's also a question about should all Minoka patients have CMR? So there's a study from uh, Professor Chiara Bucchiarelli Ducci that showed that a troponin elevation of approximately greater than 214 nanograms per litre mm -hmm. is much more likely to be associated with pathological findings in CMR. So possibly you can triage on the troponin, the troponin and the day 14 try to get the scan done. If it's not possible, still do the scan. We had a great case today where we saw a late enhancement and imaging done yeah. months later, but yeah. it was still helpful. Exactly, yeah. Still helpful. And I think if you use CMR in Minoka patients, you get more diagnosis. I yeah. think up to 85 or 100% using uh, CMR. Yeah. So I think it's very useful to uh, do it. And also to reclassify. Yeah, yeah. Change the diagnosis. Actually, we thought this was myocarditis, it's NSTEMI or you know, yeah, the other way, way around. Yeah. yeah. So, and if there are uh, viewers that would like to uh, have their own Minoka center or start a Minoka line in their center, yes. what would you advise them to start with? A Minoka team. <laughs> That's always a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> in practical terms, in interventional cardiology, we've. It's so exciting to have those different domains, professional domains that we know. All, CTO, CHIP, PCI, structural heart disease, left main. Well, keep up the enthusiasm because Minoka and yeah. diagnostics and, you know, individuals in the team may have more experience of uh, intracoronary diagnostics um, that we've mentioned already in our discussion. Yeah. And the consideration of the flow, the timing within the procedure, a second procedure, the MRI examination. So in the, in the service, in the interventional service, if you can have two or three or more individuals who've got an interest in this area, and you can just call them if you've got a Minoka case, um, just for a discussion, even out of ours. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. So start with a team. Start with the team. Okay. And in your hospital, I know they're also doing a Minoka trial, so that makes yeah. it probably a little bit easier to call the right person. Yeah. And Research enhances the quality of patient care, Yeah. Um, regardless of the study. So if a patient is going into a Minoka study, being associated with members of a research team, it provides the patient with another point of care mm -hmm. for advice to help coordinate, to help explain. Of course, you've got the study protocol, but just in principle, there's a lot of uncertainties mm -hmm. for patients in the management of Minoka. I've had a heart attack, but I don't have any blocked coronary arteries. How can this be? So when you're undertaking research, as, as you have done in your PhD, the research uh, team members have got a certain expert knowledge, which I think is helpful to the patients. Yeah, no, I totally yeah. agree. So if we could summarize, I think it's important to do the, uh, the right diagnostic pathway in yeah. Minoka patients. It starts with the patient itself, EKG, history, complaints, yes. but then in the CAT lab, we can perform microvascular dysfunction testing or vasomotor function testing yeah. or intracoronary imaging. Yes. And after the CAT lab, it's also important uh, to perform a CMR, preferably yep. within t uh, 14 days. Yes. Yeah. And if at home you also uh, would like to uh, start the Minoka line or a Minoka team, then just start by including Minoka members. Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much yeah. for today. My pleasure.